Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for coming uh, to join us this afternoon for a fascinating lecture. Uh, we're very lucky today to have Dr. Steven Zunis joining us at DU. Uh, Dr. Zunis is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco, where he's also the chair of the program in Middle Eastern Studies. Um, he is recognized as one of the countries, and I must say, perhaps the world's leading scholars of U.S. Middle East policy and of strategic nonviolent action. He received his Ph.D. from Cornell University, his M.A. from Temple, and his B.A. from Oberlin. He's previously served on the faculty at Ithaca College, the University of Puget Sound, and Whitman College. And he's the author or co-author of three books, which include Western Sahara, War, Nationalism, and Conflict Irresolution, Tinderbox, U.S. Middle East Policy and the Roots of Terrorism, and Nonviolent Social Movements, A Geographical Perspective. Dr. Zunis also serves as a senior policy analyst for the Foreign Policy and Focus Project of the Institute for Policy Studies. He's an associate editor of Peace Review, a contributing editor of Tikkun, and chair of the Academic Advisory Committee for the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Today he's going to talk uh, with us about the Arab Spring two years after, and he'll be available for questions and answers after talking for 30 to 40 minutes or so. And we'll finish promptly at 1.30. So please help me to welcome Professor Zunis to Corbell. Thank you, Erica. It's great to be here. Uh, it's been two years since the dramatic events in North Africa and the Middle East where, we, where three uh, solidly, what seemed to be solidly entrenched uh, Western-backed autocratic regimes were brought down uh, by their own people, uh, applying nonviolent, largely nonviolent means of resistance. The kinds of struggles that we've seen elsewhere in the world, from the from the Philippines to Poland, from Chile to Serbia, uh, Madagascar to the Maldives, <laughs> yet. Um, for many people, it was quite a surprise to see it uh, uh, take place in the Middle East. Uh, not, uh, in Bahrain, there was a similar nonviolent uprising, which was tragically suppressed. And in Libya and Syria, the uh, initially uh, nonviolent uh, struggles uh, turned into um, full-scale civil wars. But uh, I think one of the big lessons to learn from it is that, that, that uh, the, what's a remarkable success that we have seen uh, through the use of uh, unarmed uh, methods of resistance against highly militarized states. Um, and it's, again, it's a part of a global pattern we have been seeing for the past few decades, that uh, these are movements that recognize that you can't make change through uh, conventional uh, political methods such as um, electioneering and lobbying. You know, the, 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 the regime is too oppressive or the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, p uh, political process is stacked against any kind of change. Uh, but at the same time, you know, recognizing the, the, the many problems of armed struggle, people resort to such tactics as strikes, boycotts, mass demonstrations, uh, popular contestation of public space, tax refusal, uh, destructions of symbols of government authority like official ID cards, refusal to obey official orders such as curfew restrictions, uh, the creation of alternative institutions for uh, political legitimacy and, and social organization, that these end up being uh, m more powerful than uh, um, armed struggle because with armed struggle you're essentially uh, challenging the state where it is strongest and the instruments of repression, whereas uh, in many ways, nonviolent struggle is the ultimate asymmetrical warfare. That in uh, withdrawing consent from the governing apparatus to no longer recognizing its legitimacy, uh, it, it no longer you know, has really has the power to um, to function as as a state. And I'll be looking at uh, more more specifics on, on this. But uh, we found that these unarmed insurrections which in the vast majority of cases are not based on any kind of uh, ethical commitments to nonviolence. So we're not talking about Gandhian or Kingian nonviolence, which you know, assumes a, you know, an underlying you know, spiritual commitment or a desire to convert your opponent. Um, 
but one, you know, again, looking at it, like, looking at it in, as, as a form of, of asymmetrical warfare. Uh, Freedom House, which is a fairly mainstream uh, group uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, did a survey some, a few years ago that noticed in the you know, uh, close to 70 transitions from autocratic regimes to, to varying degrees of democracy in the past, uh, uh, in the previous three decades, they found that you know, there were some cases where uh, these reforms took place because of you know, voluntary reform efforts from the top down by political elites. There were a few cases where uh, democracy came through armed revolutions overthrowing the, uh, uh, the dictator, um, only one or two through uh, foreign intervention. They found that somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of the cases, the most important variable was democratic civil society organizations engaged in nonviolent struggle. And even more significantly uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, an article than a book that uh, Erica here uh, wrote along with her colleague Maria Stefan, which has made a huge impact, uh, not only uh, receiving a number of prestigious awards, but it's being talked about all over the place. I mean, I was at a, I was invited to speak at a conference the Presbyterian Church was having uh, on, uh, uh, and, and on, on issues of violence and nonviolence, and you had these theologians bringing up Chenoweth and Stefan, Chenoweth and Stefan, <laughs> you know, uh, that it, it is, um, yeah, the, 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 in fact, you know, I've already had a couple of people when I mentioned I was coming to uh, the University of Denver. Oh, is that where Erica Chenoweth is? Um, so it's a great coup that you have her here because this research really is having a profound impact in shaping uh, the debate about how political change takes place. But what I want to talk about is, is that, again, we, we, you know, most people are familiar with, with, with these Eastern European or Latin American, Southeast Asian cases, but there's actually before the Arab Spring, there was quite a history of nonviolent resistance in the Islamic world, in, in Iran, going back as far as the 1890s with the tobacco strike and, and other, other protests against uh, concessions to, um, to, to foreign governments and the neo-colonial um, situation there to the Constitutional Revolution, 1906. Uh, you had, uh, these were largely nonviolent uh, uprisings which had a profound impact in shaping uh, Iranian history. In Egypt in 1919, they had a largely unarmed rebellion, which led to their independence from, from Britain. Sudan, we think of Sudan as the um, ultimate case of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of a country with a history of political violence, which of course in many ways it is, but in both 1964 and 1985, autocratic military regimes were overthrown through uh, a massive nonviolent uprising, general strikes, and other kinds of protests, which led to, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, temporary um, phases of democracy for a good four years. In both cases, you you had these you know, fragile coalition governments that were democratically elected. Uh, unfortunately, it fell later to military coups. But um, uh, but even now, we're seeing uh, a revival through Garifuna, a nonviolent movement hoping to challenge the, um, uh, the military government they have now. Um, we've seen other cases in, in, um, in, 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 in Africa, in, in, in Islamic countries in Africa, like in Mali in 1991. I'll be talking about that briefly later. The overthrow of the Shah, the Iranian Revolution, though unfortunately it, it ended up going in a, a swing into a new form of authoritarianism, that was largely an unarmed insurrection, and we saw the revival in the Green Revolution of 2009, the hopes of this long-standing tradition of resistance in Iran uh, finally completing uh, the struggle for democracy there. General Rashad's regime in Bangladesh in 1990 was overthrown in an unarmed insurrection. Uh, Suharto in Indonesia, who had even more blood in his hands than Saddam Hussein, was brought down in a popular movement there. Lebanon. Under decades of Syrian domination, the, uh, uh, the Intifada Iskit Lao, known as the Sita Revolution in the West, was successful in, in, in forcing out uh, uh, the Syrians. The Tulip Revolution in Kyrgyzstan in 2006, uh, in Maldives in 2005, and even the, even the uh, ouster of the Musharraf dictatorship in Pakistan with lawyers and other civil society uh, movements taking to the streets. Uh, so again, there's nothing in Islamic uh, society that is, that is contrary to the idea 
of these kinds of unarmed insurrection. Indeed, there is an implied social contract um, within Islam, which goes back you know, to, uh, you know, to the early caliphs in the Hadith, uh, elsewhere where it emphasizes that, yes, you should obey legitimate authority, but if the authority is not legitimate, if the authority is not doing God's will, not only do you not have an obligation to obey it, a good Muslim has the, uh, the, the, the obligation to withdraw uh, one's consent, withdraw one's uh, cooperation. And of course, there have been ongoing popular nonviolent struggles prior to the 2011 um, revolutions uh, in, um, uh, in the Islamic world, you know, from, from uh, the uh, you know, Palestinians, the West Bank, and Sahrawis uh, 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 resisting occupation of Western Sahara by Morocco, pro-democracy movements in Kuwait, Bahrain, Niger, Azerbaijan, and elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, our colleague Maria Stefan actually had a book called Civilian Jihad, in which I contributed a couple um, chapters that came out about a year and a half before the Arab Spring, which talked about this uh, long-standing but often overlooked uh, tradition of, of nonviolent uh, resistance uh, in, in the Middle East. But the um, <clears throat> In looking at you know, the phenomenon uh, where in, 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 in Tunisia and, and, um, and, uh, and, and Egypt and, and, and Yemen where you had millions of ordinary people, men and women, Christian and Muslim, young and old, workers and intellectuals, uh, poor and middle class, secular and religious, facing down the truncheons, the tear gas, the water cannons, the bullets, the goon squads for their freedom, uh, it continues to be an inspiration and the, the transition have not been uh, as smooth as many people had hoped, and I'll be happy to talk about uh, Egypt and some of the other uh, cases uh, today, uh, a situation today during questions and answers. The, uh, what's, what gives me hope is that, um, and let's take Egypt for example, uh, as disturbing um, as, as things are in terms of the um, um, you know, the conservative, semi-autocratic tendencies of the, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the continued you know, domination of the uh, military and their, and their lack of accountability in terms of corruption and, and repression, uh, you know, the, the thugs that are attacking you know, the you know, pro-democracy demonstrators, the, uh, the opposition you know, whose um, who's disruption and, 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 uh, and, and um, uh, and, and, and some of their you know, and questionable tactics that we've been seeing in, in recent weeks. Uh, again, this is disturbing, but I would argue that uh, I still see hope in it because things are much better, despite everything. Things are much better than they were under Mubarak. There's much more you know, freedom of expression in terms of the media, in terms of the, the right uh, of assembly. Uh, more critically, there's a sense of empowerment. I mean, there's a sense of fatalism that was so common in the Arab world that, that uh, you know, what, you know, we're always going to be victims of the, uh, the, the elites of our autocratic rulers or what the United States or Britain or some outside power is going to do to us. That's gone. You know, people really feel like they have, have a sense of, of their own destiny. Uh, that the future is ultimately in their hands. They are the shapers of history. And I remember when I was in Egypt uh, a few months ago, or, 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 or actually, I guess it was um, earlier last year. I remember, I remember, you know, watching the TV news. I was at this cafe uh, just off Tahrir Square, and and the, the sound wasn't on, so I couldn't couldn't, couldn't hear it. But I, I remember noticing how different it was than previous visits to Egypt. Because the previous vis visits to Egypt, the nightly news was the president giving a speech, the president greeting a foreign dignitary, the president visiting the widget factory. I mean, that was the news. That was fairly typical of the news in that part of the world. But looking at the news uh, this evening, it was about a labor strike in Alexandria. It was a relatives of the martyrs of the revolution having a vigil outside the interior ministry. It was the, uh, then, uh, it was the uh, uh, a revolution you know, going on in, in, in Syria. It was yeah, uh, you know, uh, c continued you know, um, you know, protests for, for, for greater reforms going on in Yemen. And it's like, who are the newsmakers now? What constitutes the news in the Arab world now? 
And I think that really, I, I think that, that profoundly illustrates the difference the Arab Spring has, has made. Uh, because again, looking at the you know, situation in, in these particular countries, there are obviously issues of concern, but, but the, the, the whole unit of analysis in terms of how, how, things, how things change and, and, and what politics is about um, has shifted. And it kind of reminds me of, of the, the way you know, many political scientists used to look at Eastern Europe. They used to say, all you need to know about Eastern Europe is what order the uh, officials are in the, on, on, the, on the reviewing stand during the May Day Parade. <laughs> That's all you really need to know. Uh, and what it missed is the profound changes inside civil society. And so many people looking at the Middle East you know, looked simply at the elites or maybe certain rivals within the uh, military or within the elite. They totally ignored ordinary people. And, and we see how you know, profoundly wrong they were. I mean, I, I, I was, I, I, people thought I was crazy when in November of, of, of 2010, I said Egypt could be the next country to have a uh, Serbian, Filipino style unarmed insurrection. I was incorrect because Tunisia beat them to it. But um, many people were saying, how did you know that? How did you figure it out? No one else saw it. Well, basically what I saw was this, 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 this dramatic growth of civil society within Egypt. Um, and a similar thing I saw in Indo Indonesia in 1997, you know, when everybody assumes Suharto would be ruling that country until his, his deathbed. That these, these popular movements often get, uh, are often under the radar, and, and people don't recognize them until they explode on the streets. And this is another important thing, because the Egyptian Revolution, for example, did not uh, start on January 25th and end uh, two years ago today. Um, it was something that had been building you know, for, for, for many years. And it's a struggle that's continuing. Uh, that, um, and again, when, when you're talking about popular movements, again, it might be less, it's less clear cut a transition as you might find, say, in a, in a military coup or you know, something, uh, something more, more dramatic. And, and so I want to want to look a little more in detail about uh, about Mubarak in particular, but this is this is we could talk about Tunisia and Yemen as well. But first of all, it was you know people say, some people have said well it was actually more of a military coup than a revolution, but in fact it was much more of a uh, the coup de grace than a coup d'état. <laughs> the uh, military recognized that uh, there was no way that Mubarak could stay in power. Uh, they recognized that. Um, they, that, um, that if they didn't push him aside, they could be brought down as well, that the people were not going back. That a Tiananmen Square type massacre simply would not work, in large part because the troops would very likely disobey. In fact, if anything, they might turn their guns in the other direction. Indeed, Ben Ali ordered his forces to massacre the hundreds of thousands of people that were in Bogriva Avenue in Tunis several weeks earlier. And the, and the, and the commander said, we can't do that. Um, our troops would not obey us. They, again, turn our gun, guns on us. And that's when um, Ben Ali decided uh, he had to flee. Um, and this is significant because often we say, oh, Nonviolence cannot work when you have a ruthless dictator like Assad or, or like Gaddafi or whatever. But there are a lot of ruthless dictators that are willing to massacre their people. The question is the loyalty of their troops. Are they willing to follow orders? Honecker in East Germany ordered his troops to massacre people. Marcos in the Philippines ordered his troops to massacre people. And they didn't. They couldn't. And so the, um, the military, not being one to put in this situation, did move in. And, uh, and, and ousted him, but uh, it was because they had to. Their hands, hands was, their hands were forced by the people. Similarly, there are those who try to credit the United States for uh, the downfall of Mubarak, and you, you literally have some, you know, you had some people in Fox News saying, it was just, thanks to George W. Bush talking about democracy, because his Arabs couldn't, didn't even think about democracy until you know, Bush put on the, put on the uh, agenda. Of course, in reality, the invasion of Iraq actually set back the pro-democracy movement uh, because being done in the name of democracy, it ended up being used as an excuse by the regimes to, to suppress uh, pro-democracy elements. I mean, Bush did for democracy and 
the Middle East, what Stalin did for socialism in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, basically, you know, got this great, great I uh, idealistic concept and got associated with, you know, uh, domination, repression, intervention. But the, um, what, um, you know, the, the uh, I mean, to, 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 to uh, and, and similarly, Obama's speech in, in 2009 in, at, at Cairo University, well, I thought it was a decent speech overall. Again, this is, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, uh, didn't put any new ideas in anybody's heads. I mean, again, to, to Obama's credit, he insisted that uh, represent, you know, people in the opposition be allowed tickets to get into the auditorium where he was speaking, but Kafai and other groups turned them down, saying we want words, we want, we want action, not just, not just words. The uh, National Endowment for Democracy and had a, gave some limited funding to some civil society organizations, but those were actually cut back when Obama came to office. He got really gun-shy because of the overreach of the Bush administration not to be too overt in supporting um, uh, you know, uh, uh, pro-democracy struggles. He, in, in my view, he went to the other extreme, back to more of an old realpolitik kind of a, a direction. Um, but, the, um, but even these, these limited programs tended to focus on you know, election monitoring, and, and they're, they're more from the, more of the elite opposition groups, not the young, more radical grassroots groups that were in uh, stress, strategic nonviolent action, and, and, the, and, and the like. Um, Similarly, I've seen some reports that it was these uh, outside, you know, um, uh, you know, their workshops and by, uh, you know, uh, by, by foreigners in strategic nonviolent action, which was somehow responsible. Uh, there were a handful of, of, uh, of workshops, it's true. I, I know about them because I was, I, was I was part of the main one uh, that took place. But uh, let me tell you, though we, you did have some veterans of pro-democracy movements from you know, South Africa and Serbia and, and Palestine who were there and some Western academics like myself it was, we, it was not about how to overthrow Mubarak. We were simply talking about, you know, generic information on the theory and, and, and history and dynamics of strategic nonviolent action. Um, and, you know, some people learned some things from it, great. But uh, they're already thinking about this kind of stuff. In fact, one reason I was confident to, to, to make that prediction in November 2010 was that I had met these people and knew they were already far along in their thinking. Um, certainly, um, you know, Gene, um, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, Gene Sharp's uh, writings influenced some people, but but so did other theorists about uh, you know social movement, social change. Again, I, I think it's very very important that we don't uh, deny agency to uh, Middle Eastern peoples to have the smarts to figure this out themselves. It's not like some uh, to give blame or credit to some some white guys who come in from the West and start you know, stirring things up. As we, I mean, I, I've seen at least two conspiratorial websites that, that, that um, uh, uh, blame slash credit me personally for the Egyptian revolution <laughs> because I was, I was one of the participants in this workshop because I predicted it in, 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 in November. And I think, I mean, there's, there's, I think something actually you know, somewhat racist about this idea uh, that, um, that, 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 that people in the Middle East cannot uh, you know, analyze their situation, think strategically. Um, I, and, and, and even things about trying to credit Western technology. I mean, you know, calling it the Facebook revolution and stuff. Yes, the internet technology, I think, was useful in getting around, you know, official censorship and getting the word out about the, um, uh, about, you know, abuses. Most people are familiar with those already. But, in, but if you look at the actual Egyptian revolution, the internet, the most critical days, the first five days of the revolution, uh, the internet was cut off completely. Cell phone coverage was cut off completely, and that's when it grew. Um, and in fact, it might have helped it, ironically, because you had you know, uh, parents and others worried about their kids, couldn't be in touch, went out looking for them, and they got swept off in the revolution, or people who couldn't get news you know, through the internet and certainly couldn't trust the state, wanted to find out for themselves, and got, got, got swept up in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the group action. And also, of course, the thing about the internet is that the state can, can uh, um, and followed as well. So, for example, on January 25th, the official word out on the internet was that, okay, the pro democracy demonstration is going to start in, in, a, in a handful of these major squares and is going to march towards Tahrir Square. Well, and of course, the military came out in force in those four or five locations. 
But what they, what they did and said was through, through word of mouth, through leafleting others, got the word out that, no, it's not going to be at those places. Instead, it's going to be at dozens of smaller squares going through the back alleys where the armored personnel carriers and tanks can't go and then converge on, on Tiberi, Tiberi Square. And that's exactly what happened, and they are surprised themselves as you know, they, you know, as they're walking through the residential neighborhoods, you know, calling in people who are looking out their balconies to come on and join. And this, this is, I mean, again, it was not the internet that did this. Again, this is, this is, this is the street smarts of the people, people themselves. And again, so it's a tool. It's a useful tool, but it's not the cause of the revolution. I mean, I think of Mali, for example, in 1991 against the Traore dictatorship. They didn't have internet. They didn't have international media. You know, they didn't have Facebook or anything like that. In fact, the majority of Malians at that point were not even literate. They utilized griots. The singing storytellers that would go from village to village, you know, playing the Mandinka harp and, and the sing-songy historical analogies of popular struggle, they used that to mobilize the population. So in other words, if people feel a need to resist, they'll find, figure out a way of doing it. They'll use what technologies are available to their advantage, but again, that's not, not, not the same thing as causation. Um, now, the... Um, <clears throat> In, in, term, in terms of the significance of these revolutions, uh, a couple things are, are, are significant from a geopolitical uh, perspective. One is that it was a major, major blow to Al-Qaeda and other extremists. Because for years they had been arguing the only way to oust these Western-backed dictators was through subscribing to their extremist ideology, using violence and terrorism, I mean, a lot of people forget that Al-Qaeda's first attack against U.S. interests was back in 1995 in Saudi Arabia when they uh, targeted a, a training facility of, by U.S. personnel for the Saudi National Guard, which was used for internal repression. Um, but what, what the, the revolutions in Tunisia, Tunisia and, 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 and Egypt showed was that there are more effective means, that one did not have to subscribe to their you know, you know, apocalyptic uh, reactionary uh, ideology. One did not have to use violence and terror, uh, but they could, you know, they could bring down governments by uh, by other means. And it's, it's not surprising. It was right after these revolutions two years ago that the uh, the new line of recruits and money, you know, coming in to Al Qaeda and Pakistan and, and elsewhere, uh, began to dry up. Uh, it was indeed at least as, at least as important as the uh, as the uh, killing of of Osama bin Laden. And, and weakening uh, their, their base, weakening their support. But it's also a blow to the other extreme, that is the neocons and others who said the only way to bring democracy to the Middle East is through foreign invasion and occupation. And we see what a mess Iraq is in, you know, with the um, continued uh, you know, bombings, human rights abuses, uh, torture, this um, uh, chauvinistic uh, um, uh, 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 sectarian Shia coalition, uh, you know, uh, running things and you know, the ongoing uh, repression, chaos, that's, that's no model really for, for anybody. I mean, yeah, the transitions in Tunisia and, and Egypt may be a bit rough, but <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, nobody would prefer to live in Iraq today <laughs> than in uh, the, these, these, these uh, the societies where the dictators are ousted uh, internally uh, using largely uh, domestic, uh, 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 using largely nonviolent means. Which brings me to Libya. Uh, you know, Libya, um, a lot of people forget you know, that the, uh, the initial uprising during those early days when they ended up liberating you know, most cities in the uh, eastern half of the country and even some cities in, in, the, in the western part was done nonviolently. Um, it was uh, only after they took up arms, again, meeting you know, Gaddafi at his strongest, where, where, where he was strongest, that they started. Um, having a series of defeats, which then you know, prompted the, the NATO uh, in intervention. What's interesting, though, is if you look at the other end, the final fall of Tripoli, a lot of people predicted there'd be this you know, ugly final battle. In fact, um, you know, the, the, uh, the armed uh, groups you know, marched into the city largely unopposed because a good 85% of the city had been liberated by uh, insurrections within working class neighborhoods and, and elsewhere. Uh, so that all the armed groups had to do was a few mopping up operations at Gaddafi's compound and, and, and elsewhere. 
So you know when you have this, the 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 you know the most of the defe early defections you know from the uh, the um, ambassadors and members of the cabinet, the Gaddafi's cabinet and the and military officers, but, you know, good, good, most of those happen in the early nonviolent phases. So you think you know, it makes one you know, think that you know could nonviolence have worked in um, in Libya? Now it, it would have been it would have been uh, you know problematic. In, in Libya, it's a rentier state, you know. So that is, they're you know, they, they're not uh, like a, like these oil-rich states who are less dependent on their on the cooperation of the population. Uh, civil society was weak, um, so it, it would have been it would have been a challenge in any case. But um, again, I, 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 uh, I question those who say it wouldn't have worked because he was so repressive. I mean, again, those, in those early days, the numbers of people killed during the nonviolent phase of the Libyan revolution were actually uh, less. Than the equivalent period during the the Egyptian revolution, you know that the large scale massacres began only after after taking up um, taking up arms, and if you look again, this even if you compare if you do another comparison, the first six months of the Syrian uprising, which was uh, overwhelmingly nonviolent, uh, you had about three thousand killed. Compare that to the six months of the armed struggle. In Libya, we had 25,000 uh, killed, um, and and so uh, you, you, again, there's a, there's uh, there's um, but we also have to look at sort of the consequences of of Libya. Yes, Gaddafi was overthrown. That's a great thing, <laughs> uh, a horrific regime on on a whole number of levels. They alienated pretty much everybody: right, left, center, secular, <laughs> Islamist. Um, but what have we seen afterwards? On the one hand, they had fairly successful elections and relatively moderate you know, parties have come to power. And yet, but how much authority does the government really have? When you have a country of barely six million people with over 200,000 men in power of militias that are not controlled by the government. And in so many, I keep hearing reports in various cities that the elected, you know, the, the town, the city government is is it is, 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 is does not control things. It's the militias that have, control things. There 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 there, there is an incident uh, you know, last year where there was battling for the spoils of you know, Tripoli Airport. I you know, occasionally read an article like this: this guy, um, hotel owner, you know, finally threw out this militia leader who hadn't paid his uh, bill in months, and so the militia leader came back that afternoon with his buddies and shot up the place. I mean, the, the extortion uh, going on, the revenge killings, uh, many hundreds of, of suspected Qaddafi loyalists have been summarily executed, uh, as is what well as, of course, Qaddafi himself. You, um, and you have black Africans, many of whom have actually lived in Libya for generations, um, who have been targeted because there were some black Africans who were mercenaries in, 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 in Qaddafi's uh, um, um, army. But uh, you know, you know and, and, and then you have the spillover effect. I, I've talk, talked about Mali, about how in, back in 1991 they overthrew the dictatorship for 20 years. Mali was, was, you know, had free elections, free press, um, a growing you know, civil society. In many ways it was, it was one of the more successful countries in Western Africa. The Tuareg rebels, in return for some uh, limited autonomy, uh, had, had ceased fighting. There was a ceremony in, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Bamako, the capital, where they brought all their arms and dumped them in a big pile and set them on fire. And yet, with, the, um, with, with all these caches of arms suddenly available during the chaos of the armed, armed struggle, and these ammunition stores were, were, were taken, you, got the, you, know, you had these uh, Tuaregs who, in Libya who passed it on to their kinsmen in um, in, in northern Mali, uh, the rebellion, which uh, due to a number of factors had resumed, but on a fairly small scale, suddenly had the means to quickly take over uh, you know, parts of the country. Uh, the Malian military, uh, thinking that the civilian government wasn't cracking down hard enough, uh, staged a coup led by a U.S. trained um, army officer. Uh, and that further divided the military, which enabled the Tuaregs to end up taking over the entire northern part of the country, but they are stretched too so thin, and the, um, again, the, uh, the central government was in chaos. That enabled these radical Islamists, who'd also gotten a lot of new arms, thanks to the uh, uh, Libyan war, to end up taking over northern Mali, and then, of course, we had the, the French intervention, 
Um, uh, and you know, we're seeing this kind of, and so unlike Tunisia, where there was this positive spillover effect in terms of a, of a, of a nonviolent pro-democracy struggle, the spillover effect from Libya has been a far, um, um, far more problematic. Um, and Syria. Now Syria, it would be, it would be a challenge uh, for a number of reasons. For one thing, that they, the regime, as bad as it's been, has a much stronger base than the regimes in Libya or Tunisia or Egypt uh, or, or, or Yemen. Um, they have a, um, uh, the Ba'ath Party, and it's, it's more than just one guy. When you have a, when you, when you have a regime, it's essentially one man rule. Uh, it's pretty easy you know, to, to organize a movement against them because they may have a few cronies who benefit directly, but don't have a lot of, a lot of support ultimately in society as a whole. Um, this is, for example, and, and, and as opposed to regimes that are more oligarchical, which kind of you know uh, spread the privileges you know out beyond one person. One reason why the why if you, those who are familiar with Central American history, you know, that's that Somoza Nicaragua classic Cadillo one man rule was toppled you know, fairly quickly in an armed revolution, whereas the the the, the, the military civilian junta in El Salvador, uh, where you know was. Um, was able to to uh, stay stay in power and fought to a, a bloody stalemate, despite the fact that the FMLN, the rebel movement in El Salvador, by most measures, was far stronger than the Sandinistas were in Nicaragua. Well, similar with the Middle East, that that Syria again had a stronger social base. You had the Ba'ath Party that had been ruling the country for the better part of 50 years. Assad and his father had been ruling for 40, but they they had you know they had party offices in virtually every neighborhood in town. The army played a major major role. In, in, in society, in, in, in the government. Um, and there's some debate about how, how much Assad, the younger Assad is in, in, in charge. You know, he's not nearly as dominating a figure as, as his father, father was. Also, they used a kind of a divide and rule to get the various minorities, not just the Alawites, which, are the, which is the um, sectarian group where the, uh, the Assad family comes from, but you know, Christians, Druze, others, uh, other minorities feel like they have a stake in the system. And, they're, 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 and they, they developed a crony capitalist class centered primarily among the Sunni, Mus Sunni Muslim majority, which uh, has, has, has had a stake in the system. So in other words, you're talking about a, 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 um, a government that, again, while certainly a minority, is a fairly sizable minority of the population. Perhaps as many as a third of the people actually are back of the regime. And, uh, and, and, this, and, and it, so, so in other words, it, it's going to be, no matter whether it's violent or nonviolent, the resistance in Syria is going to be was going to be uh, more of a more of a problem, but it's also I think underscores why it's very important in a, in, in a struggle to not to alienate your potential allies. You want to mobilize your population to the maximum degree, uh, and the shift to armed struggle uh, tragically has um, solidified the support for the regime, because even a lot of people who don't necessarily like Assad are nervous about what they're seeing, especially as you're getting these uh, Salafis and other uh, hardline Islamist, Islamist groups in the mix of the armed struggle um, that do not have a democratic agenda. They do not envision a more you know, pluralistic uh, uh, um, and democratic uh, uh, Syria. The, um, and the um, so I, I would argue that, again, I don't make moral judgments against oppressed people who feel the uh, need to take up arms. I, I'm not a strict pacifist, uh, I, but I, I recognize that an, enough in terms of the power dynamics that the, the armed struggles in both you know, Libya and Syria, while one can understand, are, I, 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 think, I think the consequences are, are, are far more deleterious than a lot of people uh, acknowledge. The, um, and indeed, we're, there's increasing evidence that the, um, um, the key elements of the Syrian opposition took up arms in the hopes there would be, it would provoke a foreign military intervention. That's why I see men, the tragedy unfolding in Syria as yet another um, uh, negative consequence of the decision to intervene in, um, in Libya. And finally, I just want to point out that We've got to question, I think, the, the, the motivation 
of, of, of outside interference in, in, these, in these struggles. Uh, because at the same time, you know, Britain, the United States, and others were pressing for military intervention and involved in military intervention in, uh, in Libya. The United States was backing the government in Bahrain, uh, which was brutally suppressing what, on a per capita basis, was the largest <laughs> uh, pro-democracy movement in the entire Arab Spring. Uh, nearly a third of the population at one time or another was out on the streets and their discipline to nonviolence was, was, was actually stronger than, than virtually any other, any other uprising. Uh, and yet uh, the United States, with the Fifth, Fifth Fleet you know, based in, in Bahrain, uh, uh, largely supported. You know, there's just some, some finger wagging at the repression and, and uh, um, Obama you know, publicly on a number of occasions you know, called on the regime to uh, to negotiate and not, not throw everybody in jail. Um, U.S. military aid and other support you know, has continued and raises questions about you know, whether this um, kind of, um, you know, as, as whether the, the pull to intervene is really about uh, promoting democracy and ending repression and how much of it is for geopolitical interests. And the more we see that, of course, the more uh, that it plays into the hands of the dictators who want to justify that, that re repression. And so, I, so I, I have to close with just one observation that, that those of us um, here in the United States, um, we shouldn't st simply stand by as cheerleaders of these pro-democracy struggles, but to, to look at our, our government's own history in supporting um, uh, an uh, authoritarian rule in the Middle East. Um, and because as long as the, um, so, and indeed, I'd say as long as the United States uh, continues to, to be the world's number one supporter of the remaining autocratic regimes in the Middle East and elsewhere, perhaps the country that needs nonviolent resistance the most in order to advance democracy in the Middle East is right here at home. Thank you. If you would, when you ask your question, just identify yourself. Thank you for a great talk, really. Uh, and uh, uh, even here, we don't hear uh, what you just told us. I suspect that it doesn't all come from textbooks <laughs> or in scholarly research. Uh, so we'll have to have a conversation on that. Uh, just to uh, uh, confirm what you started with about uh, the role of nonviolent movements everywhere, I'd like to. Uh, uh, mention that right now as we stand here uh, and talk, uh, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, they are having such a movement again. Mm -hmm. And what is really fascinating and, and encouraging about this one is that it is very explicitly against uh, clerical fascism mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and pro-democracy organized by young people like, like who are here. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you'd like to know more about it, I'd be very happy to uh, to uh, give you some resources. I have written a few op-eds myself mm -hmm. and, uh, and solidarity messages, etc. They need all the solidarity mm -hmm. they can master. So I think that was my <laughs> kind of appeal. Uh, I have a question about uh, 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 democracy and, and the mix of violence and non-violence. Mm -hmm. It would be quite true to say that uh, even French Revolution really started out as non-violent, mm -hmm. you know. Bastille, <laughs> 14th of July, 18, uh, 1789, mm. uh, was largely nonviolent. Uh, mm. The reign of terror really started in 1793. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, for a long time, French Revolution was mm -hmm. uh, nonviolent. Um, uh, and so was the Bolshevik Revolution that mm -hmm. people uh, yeah. don't uh, really see. Yeah, the, the Soviets, the workers' councils, and yeah, uh, yeah, they're they were attacked by 19 powers. Mm -hmm. uh, right. <laughs> Uh, uh, so uh, it's a very complex history, I mm. think, um, uh, and like you, I don't think uh, I'm, I'm personally very nonviolent, although I did fight in a war, um, yeah, maybe especially because of that, I'm very nonviolent. Mm. Uh, but I, I do, do think that uh, uh, there are very complicated situations, and even if you have Gandhi in your heart and mm. me in your heart, mm -hmm. uh, you have to, you, you are forced sometimes yeah. to mm -hmm. follow other strategies. So uh, uh, the question is the following. Um, uh, people use democracy in many different senses, and, and some of us, uh, uh, like you know, Benjamin Barber, who talks about weak versus strong democracy, I talk about formal versus deep democracy, mm -hmm. or deepening of democracy. Uh, 
what is really going on in the Middle East? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, can you isolate some ideas, groups, factions, uh, organizations, uh, uh, political programs, where you see uh, uh, a realization uh, of uh, both the complexity yeah. of, of, of tactical issues, mm -hmm. uh, but also some clarity about the strategic issues about uh, what kind of democracy mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, it sounds like rhetoric, sure. but more genuine sure. democracy yeah. you can really do. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the form a democracy takes can vary um, depending on a country's unique history and culture. But I do believe that the desire for, um, you know, political freedom and, and, and social justice is universal. I've spent enough time uh, in, in the Middle East and and elsewhere to recognize that uh, Muslims and Arabs don't like to be jailed, tortured, and murdered for their political beliefs any more than uh, Western Christians do. Uh, and an advantage of strategic nonviolent action is that in order to succeed, you need to build broad coalitions with different parts of, of, of civil society that you may not agree with on every issue, but you can unite in the desire to bring down the, 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 the dictator. And, uh, and from there, you can, um, within a more democratic, pluralistic system, you know, work out the details of what kind of you know, system that you want to have. And sometimes the transition is smoother than others. But uh, contrast this with, with armed struggle, which is based on an armed vanguard, an elite self-appointed vanguard, uh, with, a, with a strict military hierarchy and martial values, and the lesson that power comes from the barrel of a gun, uh, you know, there, you know, that doesn't bode well for a democratic transition. There, there are some cases like Romania and a few others, you know, that that did make that uh, um, make that transition. But the vast majority of times, indeed, uh, um, Erica's research has has con confirmed this: that uh, that uh, dictatorships overthrown through armed struggle in the vast majority of cases, end up as new dictatorships and or in chaotic situations of militias battling each other and, and for the control from the spoils, whereas nonviolent uh, movements, uh, the majority of time, not all the time, but the majority of times, within a few years, end up being stable democracies, you know, for again, the reasons I, I, I just explained. So I, you know, I, I, I have my own views about what a democratic society would look like and, and people, people may have their own, but but uh, to have any form of democracy, you know, the chances are dr greatly increased if the, by the methods that people, um, the methods that people employ. And again, this is not a value judgment. This is, again, you know, you know based on, on you know, as I mentioned, the, 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 the nature of the struggle and the, um, and, and the precedent that, uh, that it sets. you're just forced to mm. take up arms, but I wonder if you had a little bit more insights about when people start to move mm. from non-violent to non-violent, so mm. what are the dynamics mm. you experience? And the question of when people, you know, choose to take up arms and, and the like, it, it varies considerably. Um, I mean, and, and you know, the, the non-violent struggle in Libya only lasted a few days before they ended up taking up arms. And in Syria, they maintained a pretty exclusive non-violent discipline despite an enormous pressure. Um, you know, for a good six months or, or more. Um, we, but we, we've seen some cases where, th where groups have gone back in the other direction. Uh, in, in South Africa, you know, they have a non exclusively nonviolent struggle. They, you know, after the Sharpeville massacre in the early 1960s, they went to, to armed struggle. But while they never formally renounced the armed struggle, uh, you know, by the 1980s, uh, I think said, um, uh, it was the, it was the uh, civil society through the United Democratic Front, uh, Kasatu, the trade union movement, and, and uh, the uh, political wing of the ANC that was, um, you know, through, through um, actions in the townships and in strikes and boycotts and other means, uh, you know, the, 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 the ANC recognized that, you know, this is a much more likely way to bring down apartheid. Uh, than armed struggle. Not, again, not because they had renounced armed struggle, because they were opposed to armed struggle in principle. But you know, the South African state was 
completely prepared to challenge armed struggle. They never got beyond occasional bombings of largely symbolic targets. There was, they never had any liberated territories or anything like that. That was but what happened in the townships was that people ended up creating their own alternative institutional, alternative court systems, alternative city governments, alternative police force, and and they and and you know the, the regime no longer had uh, had control. Um, there's also so. Um, yeah, it, it uh, rarely, and, and again, it, it, it depends a lot on, on, the, um, on how prepared the uh, nonviolent struggle is, because in any movement, you got to think strategically. I mean, in many ways, it's, it's not a matter, it's, in many ways, it's less a matter of violence versus nonviolence, is, is, you know, having a good assessment of your strengths and weaknesses, and, and an assessment of your opponent's strengths and weaknesses, and then thinking strategically about how you gain advantage over that opponent. And in what you know, the research that people like me and Erica and others have done is that, that you know, strategically, tactically, the overwhelming majority of the time, not 100%, but overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming majority of the time, that, that uh, you know, nonviolent methods are strategically more effective. Now, that doesn't mean that any nonviolent me <laughs> method is going to work. Obviously, for example, in a, in a, uh, in a, um, if you're dealing with a regime like Assad in, in Syria, for example, Maybe having, uh, where he does maintain loyalty of some segments of the security forces, um, maybe having uh, massive street demonstrations uh, where a bunch of people are going to be massacred might not be the best tactic at that particular stage of the struggle. Just like a guerrilla army can't expect in its early days to uh, have a full-scale offensive on the capital and expect they're going to win. The guerrilla army is going to have to start with small hit and run operations, build a base of support in the countryside or wherever, you know, uh, you know, do, you know, you know think, and think strategically. And unfortunately, there's, um, you have a lot, of, a lot of movements saying, oh, we tried this tactic and it failed, therefore nonviolence doesn't work. We have to take up armed struggle. Well, maybe that particular tactic failed, but there are literally hundreds of other tactics that one can utilize. And you've got to think, think about how you logically sequence the tactics. So again, whatever method, whether it be violent or nonviolent, you need to think strategically. And I think part of the failures, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, nonviolent uh, 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 uprisings that failed or didn't work, rarely, if ever, do you find it's because they used nonviolence. It's because the particular tactics or sequencing of tactics or other factors uh, was, not a, what was not strategically smart. Uh, the other thing that was implied by the, by the previous question about um, you know, the, the movements that have, have mixed tactics. Um, Machi Bartowski just came out with a book, it just came out a week or so ago, it's an anthology that looks at a lot of these armed revolutions that we, we, we think of historically, uh, you know, from, from Mozambique to, to, to Cuba, and, you know, I, I forget all the cases, but, but there, there, there are quite a few of them, where you found that, the, that there are significant nonviolent components of the revolutions, but because the people involved in the armed struggle ended up taking, uh, taking over uh, the government, they kind of wrote the history to make it sound like it was it was them alone that were responsible, you know, for the uh, for, for the uprising, and so obviously the FLN in Algeria, let's say, is only the armed struggle, and not the mass of actions by civil society, by trade unionists and others in Algiers and Iran and other places that you know uh, made it made it impossible for for French colonialism to um, uh, you know to, to continue. Uh, so I, yeah, yeah, I. Uh, so, 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 so much of the, sometimes the decision is not even a conscious decision, sometimes it's out to just shift arm struggle, it could be out of just your frustration and, and desperation and anguish. Sometimes because I mentioned in Syria, they may be hoping to provoke a, a foreign uh, intervention. But I think more often it's just because people haven't thought strategically or realized the array of tactics one can use in a, a nonviolent, in a nonviolent struggle. And I think that one thing that's exciting about the kind of, um, research that Erica and others are doing, is that it, by, by chronicling this, uh, it enables people to recognize that there are, um, that there are ways of, of thinking strategically about this. And so a lot of places where people do feel that it's hopeless to continue nonviolently and that they have to take up arms, they have to recognize that you know, maybe there's there some other things we can do that's differently than we've been doing up to now and successfully, but is not, <laughs> But that doesn't mean you know give up on on, on nonviolent means and 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 and, and, and switch to full scale armed insurrection. Uh, I've read that there is the beginning of uh, thoughts about nonviolent resistance in the Palestinian territories. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, do you have any pulse on yeah. that? Well, nonviolent resistance to the Palestinian territories has been uh, going on in many ways for, for decades. Uh, the initial part of the general strike back in the 1930s uh, was mostly nonviolent. Indeed, uh, despite the iconic image of the first intifada, the kids throwing stones, you know, 90% um, of the resistance in that movement uh, through, the, through, through the strikes, the boycotts, the alternative institutions, and, and, and the like was, uh, was, was largely nonviolent. And there have continued to be um, during phases, and, and we're seeing more and more recently, smaller acts of nonviolent resistance, often using allies from the Israeli peace movement and internationals to stop the expansion of the illegal separation wall in the occupied territories, uh, you know, new construction of new settlements, and the like. The problem is, is that, uh, and we, we can we find this even in the United States when you have uh, you know, demonstrations, Occupy, or whatever, you know, the media will always take the most violent component of, of a movement and present that as the total movement. So when you have Hamas and other extremists, you know, that becomes what the Palestinians' <laughs> struggle is about. And we miss the far more significant, both in terms of numbers and political impact, of, of, the, of the ongoing nonviolent struggle. I find it very interesting that during the first intifada, Israel arrested, detained, tortured, and then expelled Mubarak Awad, who was head of the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence, who was advocating nonviolent methods, while they allowed Sheikh Yassin, the founder of Hamas, to, to run free, passing out Arabic translations of protocols, the elders of Zion, and calling for the destruction of Israel and armed struggle. And there was at least a year or so before they finally detained him. Because of them, who was the bigger threat to the occupation? Um, and and we, we've seen this on a, no, a number of occasions, that, the, um, that, you know, the, that during the first intifada, these popular committees, these alternative institutions, get you in prison for years uh, because the Israelis recognized that that was a more effective means of, of challenging their, their, their occupation. And it's much you know, politically more convenient to, to uh, depict the Palestinian resistance as, again, its most extreme, um, extreme component. What's exciting about the, what's been happening in recent years is that the people who are interested in strategic nonviolent action are not just sort of the you know, moderate Christian intellectuals or, you know, or whatever, but you're finding that you know, some very main, some of the, even some of the young Tanzim militants from the second Intifada, which was quite violent, of course, um, even they are recognizing that, hey, this is, if not for ethical reasons or legal reasons, at least for pragmatic reasons, they're saying, hey, this is ridiculous. We cannot hope to defeat uh, Israel uh, militarily. That using terror, even putting aside the, you know, the obvious moral uh, legal, legal issues, uh, ends up just hardening Israeli attitudes and, and, and strengthens you know, the right, and especially when you look at Jewish history and, and, the, and the sense they all, everybody wants to kill us anyway, you know, kind of, kind of thing. Um, that are, that, you know, they're, they're getting more and more interested in this um, and, 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 and mobilizing it. But I think. Uh, um, but I think this is also another question where the U.S. role, where we've tended to support uh, the, uh, the, the Israeli government in, in, in ways that I personally think are not just bad for the Palestinians, but ultimately bad for Israel. I think that, that, that we need to you know, look at, look at that, that angle as well, because it's, um, we need to convince the Palestinians that nonviolent resistance can help, because if they see that you know, non, you know, that the U.S. is going to support, uh, you know, you know and veto U.N. Security Council resolutions, give unconditional military aid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, no matter how nonviolent they are, you know, it's not going to, um, it's not going to make a good case for the remaining Palestinians who still believe that this believed in an armed struggle. This is a follow-up on that question. Do you see any prospects in this second Obama administration for resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? You know, prospects for resolution of Israel-Palestinian conflicts under the Obama administration. Um, well, I think in its favor, I think uh, um, President Obama is the first uh, president who I think, in addition to knowing and appreciating the Israeli narrative, also knows and appreciates the Palestinian narrative. I don't think he has a lot of the ideological blinders that um, um, previous presidents you know, have had that, that have kind of gotten in the way. And I think he has a pretty good idea of that, uh, that, that, you know, that, the, we're, that the window for a two-state solution, which is really the only realistic uh, hope for peace, I think, at least uh, in the foreseeable future, that window is closing very rapidly unless uh, the, you know, the, the settlements, the colonization of the West Bank ends and some kind of viable Palestinian state can, can emerge. And at this point, the uh, 
Palestinian Authority under, um, under Abbas and Fayyad are taking a far, far more moderate position than the, uh, than the Israeli government. But U.S. policy teams seems to act like it's you know, back in the 50s where <laughs> Israel's more willing to compromise than the Arabs just want to wipe it off the map. Um, but I, th I, I think a lot, I, I think the biggest uh, hope would be again that the, the Palestinian resistance um, you know, can, can be as nonviolent as possible. And, and demonstrate that they want their freedom from occupation. They don't want to, to just destroy Israel. I think that would, that, would, that would help. But I also think there needs to be, be, a, be a shift here that I, I find it quite amazing that there are a lot of, um, of um, you know, that a lot of otherwise liberal Democrats, you know, who've been fairly decent on human rights and international law issues from Central America to East Timor, you know, tend to uh, uh, support Netanyahu. <laughs> and how, you know, a lot of groups like, uh, you know, you know, move on, democracy for America, et cetera, give these liberal Democrats, erstwhile liberal Democrats, their unconditional support, whereas if they had taken comparable positions on Central America, there'd be protests and, and people would be, be upset. So I think a lot of it comes down here to the United States. And in fact, Obama was asked about, when he was running for president five years ago, whether he'd be willing to apply tough love or whatever you want to describe towards Israel, you know, unconditional support for Israel's right to exist in peace and security, but willing to actually pressure them to make the necessary compromises for peace. And he answered that question by telling a story. And the story was about A. Philip Randolph, the um, a former um, uh, 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 civil rights and, and trade union leader, African American leader from the early 20th century, who was head of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters which was the uh, major black trade union movement. This is back when, when passenger trains were the main form of interstate uh, transit. And they needed federal protection in order to legally organize a union at, at that point. So he, he met the newly elected President Roosevelt in 1933 in the White House and made his case about why we needed this. And FDR listened to him and when he was done, he says, okay, you convinced me, now make me do it. Find me a, build a constituency that will make me do it. And uh, within a few months, the United States Congress had signed, uh, Congress had passed, and Roosevelt had signed the uh, National uh, Railway Labor Relations Act. That is how Obama answered that question. Make me do it. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Oliver Kaplan. I'm a professor here. I'd like to thank you for your remarks. But I'd also like to press you a little bit on your predictive ability. Mm -hmm. So you uh, claimed that early on you could tell that Egypt was headed for a revolution. Mm -hmm. so that was clear to you after speaking with some of the activists. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of revolutions, uh, it's, always, it's not exactly clear, and it can be very hard to predict. And in fact, in a lot of revolutions, uh, the claim is made that it's now out of never. So some of the work by Timur Kuran or Susan Lohman that talk about cascades of hidden preferences, people feeling re slowly reassured as they see other protesting is something that's very hard to predict and very hard to, to analyze mm -hmm. beforehand. So uh, in a case like Egypt, although you may have met with some of the activists, to me it seems like it really could have gone either way in the beginning and that's not clear mm -hmm. that they were headed towards uh, a successful mm -hmm. nonviolent protest. So in those <coughs> cases, uh, how, can, so how can we get a better sense of how to predict these, these movements, given that a lot of the action, whether it was in Eastern European protests or other protests is very hidden and, yeah. and behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. The question is about uh, predicting you know, revolutions, given that so much is behind the scenes, so, you know, so much is not, not visible. I, mean, I should acknowledge, in terms of, of my predictions of Egypt, I did not expect it to be as, as, as soon as it was, or as massive as it was initially, or, or successful as quickly as it was. I was expecting a more protracted you know, kind, of, uh, a kind of struggle that would uh, you know, last many, many months. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, clearly, you know, there's, there's, you know, there is a still a very state-centric bias, I think, in, um, in, in examining you know, issues of, of stability and instability and 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 and, and potential uh, potential for change. Uh, and I think I think we need to we need to challenge that. We need to you know, you know think of, of ways of, of measuring you know, these things more 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 precisely. I mean, I, I think in in uh, in the case of, of, of um, uh, of Egypt, I see. Um, you know, I'm not uh, not uh, optimistic in the short to medium term. I think it's going to be pretty pretty chaotic, a little crazy. But I think we are seeing the. Um, but in the long term, I'm actually pretty optimistic because we do see this new generation of uh, a, a youthful generation, which are a huge percentage of the population in Egypt and in most of the countries in this part of the world. 
who do have a, a more, more democratic uh, and, 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 uh, and, and uh, social justice uh, based vision and more secular, and I use that word guardly because by secular I don't mean that they are, are, aren't, or they're atheists. I mean secular because most of these people are observant. You'll notice the protest against the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, most of the women have headscarves on. You know, so, it's, it's, so uh, when I say secular, I mean secular in outlook in terms of the role of the state, not, not, not in terms of their own personal you know, religious proclivities uh, necessarily. But I think the trend is very much in, in that kind of direction. I think one measurement is, the, uh, with, is when ideological hegemony fails. That is, uh, if you look at, um, say, Eastern Europe in the 1970s or, or early 80s, um, they were some years away before bringing down the system, but people didn't believe the official ideology anymore. You know, the working class said, this is not socialism, <laughs> you know, this is a self-appointed elite that are using socialist rhetoric to keep their, you know, selves in power. And one of the profound things about solidarity was in getting, the, even though they, they, they're, 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 they, they, um, their initial goals are fairly limited, recognize our independent trade union, that was, um, that, that, that was a brilliant move because just in doing that, the state essentially acknowledged they're not the worker state. If they're worker state, why do you need an independent trade union? Because we won already, right? You know, <laughs> and and so and, and maybe as I see Iran in that situation today, that is still a few years ago away from bringing down the system, but even devout Muslims who believe in the idea of an Islamic republic in principle, saying this is Islamic republic is neither, <laughs> you know, again, to self, you know, uh, this this you know, self-appointed elite who are just interested in their own 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 power. And so I think that's one measure, one measure to look at when people no longer, you know, buy into the um, buy into the system. And so the question is, how do you, how then do you can, can you or, organize from there? Again, let me use Poland as an example. This gets back to one of the questions on strategic issues. Um, the big difference between them and 1980, uh, the, the, you know, their 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 success in 1989 and, and then the, and the, and the crushing of the pro-democracy movement in China was that in in Poland, instead of massing all their people in the middle of the square in, in, in Poland and in Warsaw and challenging the whole system, they end up occupying their factory, going for limited demands, winning those limited demands and using it as a base to get bigger demands and gradually. And when they when martial law is declared and they crack down, you know, a year and a half after the initial recognition of solidarity, they were, they were massive enough, well organized enough, so they could continue organizing underground and um, eight years later, we're capable of bringing down the system as, as a whole. Um, so in other words, they were thinking strategically, sequencing their tactics. Again, unlike those poor idealistic students in, 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 in China who thought that just by massively occupying Tiananmen Square, they could somehow bring down the whole system immediately. And of course, we saw what, you know, saw what happened to them. So I guess another thing I would look at is, 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 is think about what kind of, you know, what, what kind of organization you know, people have and just in terms of their, their ability to, to, to mobilize on that you know, disenchantment in, a, in, a, in an effective manner. In terms of a comparative politics perspective, is there different organizing mechanisms happening in presidential systems than in mon monarchies? Mm -hmm. Something like Bahrain that you brought up that was mm -hmm. particularly repressive, um, are there, are there more repressive tactics going on in monarchies than in presidential systems? The question is, is uh, the differences in terms of repressive tactics in, among presidents and uh, presidential systems and, and monarch monarchical systems. Uh, you know, both can be uh, b both can be uh, just as cruel, just as repressive. I think the uh, you know some some monarchies arguably you know might you know uh, might uh, have some legitimacy in some segments of the population that uh, presidential systems uh, do not. Um, but the, I, I think um, the, uh, the, 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 it's interesting that, uh, that sometimes within monarchical, monarchical systems, you know, the, the opposition can talk about, let's just have a constitutional monarchy, you know, where you know, the royal family can stay in power and have their, have their perks, have their privileges, and, and have the legitimacy, the people can adore them or whatever, but have the political decisions in the hands of the people. And the initial demands of the move in Bahrain was just for that. They weren't saying, you know, down with the monarchy. 
you know, they were just, they were just wanting, you know, they wanted a parliament that actually had some power, a parliament that was uh, generally representative and not, not, not gerrymandered and dominated by appointees of the, of, of, of the king, a parliament that, that uh, where there was an opportunity to override a royal veto, you know. Um, and but because these modest demands were not met, then you, you got some more radical elements coming to the fore and the opposition that are calling for abolishing the monarchy altogether. And you know, that, you know, that, that, of course, you know, in many ways, um, you know, so, you know, got some of the regime supporters to you know, be even more solidly <laughs> behind the, uh, the throne than they, than they would already. So, I mean, so, so the differences, I think, raise some interesting questions about, uh, the, the, about the scope of demands and, 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 and organizations and how you appeal and that kind of thing. But I, I haven't seen any difference in terms of state response in terms of, of repression. We also saw how Jordan when the, and, and Morocco, when they were initially met by, by protests early in the Arab Springs, were able to engage in some, some reforms, probably not significant enough in the long term, but at least you know, for the time being, were enough to 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 appease the uh, you know the concerns of a, of, a, of, a, of a critical mass. Thank you for a very enlightening talk on current quest day. I'm Professor here, and I've read Tinderbox, hmm. uh, which, as I recall, was published by a press called Courage. Common Courage, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was courageous mm -hmm. that you published something that was very critical of U.S. policy, and I think it's still very germane today, even though it came out a decade. I would like you to speak a little bit more about the U.S. reaction to Arab Spring. You've mentioned the kind of non-reaction to the politics that were going on in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. But that really brings me to the main focus on the two U.S. allies in the region, Israel and Saudi Arabia. And what kind of backstories do you think were worked out during the time of the Arab Spring mm -hmm. to uh, confront those allies or to treat them well? Okay. Question about U.S. policy and reaction to the uprisings, particularly uh, involving uh, um, our allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel. Uh, the, um, I mean, very. Uh, this took Washington by surprise, big time, um, and they were they were you know, really scrambling, playing playing catch up. Um, and there are divisions uh, in general. Uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton and Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. Uh, tended to advocate for backing our allied regimes, whereas uh, you know in the the, the White House and you know, the number of people in the NSC and uh, and I think Obama himself, uh, they, they tended to be more sympathetic I think to the pro democracy um, uprising either as a matter of principle or just rec recognizing it would be bad for the United States to be seen as being on the wrong side of history. Um, but uh, you know, it, this, is, this is a kind of, you know, it's amazing. Our country has a gazillion contingency plans for all sorts of crises around the world, particularly in the Middle East. But the one thing that seems to be off our radar and that of most nation states is that ordinary people engaging in a civil insurrection. Once again, this society of not, of not really appreciating the, the power of, of, of ordinary uh, people. Um, it was it was catch up. It was interesting to see how U.S. policy went from initial support to the, to the regime, to um, calling for reform within the regime, to calling for an eventual transition to democracy, to calling for a more immediate transition to democracy. But in but but in both Tunisia and, and in Egypt, you know, Obama came at least really eloquent eloquent statements in support of democracy and the struggle. It was literally the day after the dictator <laughs> stepped down. Um, so uh, it, it, was, it was definitely playing, definitely playing catch up. I mean, beyond, behind the scenes, I think there was somewhat, the administration deserves a little more credit than, than perhaps they got uh, deserved, particularly in, in e Egypt. Um, I think that, uh, um, but, and, and uh, I was privy to some of the conversations in, in, inside the White House at the, at the time, and, and, it, it, and, and Obama was getting you know, getting a lot of contradictory um, uh, device, but, uh, advice, but I think he did recognize that ultimately, you know, that, that the United States, United States did have to, uh, the, the United States they did have to, to eventually be, get behind those who created change. Okay, and, that, and to talk about, going back to what I was saying about the traditional fatalism in the Arab world, uh, this idea that, you know, what happens in Washington ultimately impact what happens in the so-called Arab street that they recognize, whoa, the Arab street is impacting what's happening in Washington. <laughs> and again, who, who are the drivers of history and, uh, and, and the like. Um, I think in terms of um, 
I think Saudi Arabia obviously was key in terms of Bahrain. I think the United States, uh, you know, um, um, uh, recognized that um, Saudi Arabia was going to make sure it was crushed. Not, not as uh, some people say, because they didn't want the president of a Shia run Arab state, but I think it was more that they were concerned about the president of a democracy. <laughs> that was actually a bigger fear for them. And uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, that, um, and, and, and because it was a monarchy that did have support, again, of a solid minority in, in Bahrain, that is a Sunni population, which had, had, had been convinced that their future lay with the monarchy. I think the combination of things that led them to, to, to for, for um, well, I think, personally, do not think it, it's a, a morally defensible position. I think, uh, you know, strategically, that was where they, where, where they were coming from. I don't think Israel was really much of a factor here. Um, basically because I think the administration recognized that, that, um, well, that um, as, you know, as distressed as, 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 as the Netanyahu government was about you know, some of these things, that there was nothing that Israel could do about it, uh, that in the long term, uh, how, the, how America was seen by hundreds of millions of Arabs was more important uh, than, than how it was seen by, by the Israeli right. Um, that, uh, that, the, that there was no immediate strategic threat you know, to Israel you know, f as a result of these you know, transitions. Uh, that uh, you know, e Egypt was going to have priorities in trying to get their society together before provoke a, what would be a you know, <laughs> suicidal <laughs> conflict uh, with Israel, which is far, far, far more powerful than, uh, than Egypt. And in fact, Back in, you know, the, the Egypt side, you know, lost badly in four previous wars when strategically they were they were actually in a better shape than they are now, <laughs> relatively speaking. So I, 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 uh, I don't think that um, uh, you know, certainly um, a lot of policies the United States has in the Middle East, uh, particularly dealing with the Palestinians, uh, they they take uh, Israeli concerns into account. I, I, I don't think Israel was a, ma was a major factor in, in the U.S. decision making regarding the Arab Spring. My name is Jonathan Pinkney. I'm a student here. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what some of the major questions for uh, scholars of civil resistance or, or strategic nonviolent action are in the context of the Arab Spring. Yeah. You know, challenges and you know, questions about the uh, uh, scholars of strategic nonviolent action in the Arab Spring. Um, well, it, it, you know, it, it adds uh, more data, and the more data you have, obviously, the the the, the better you know the the better the field is in terms of its, of its uh, you know, information uh, that we can work with and, and, and looking at some of the broader, broader issues. Um, the fact that it was, you know, got a fair amount, amount of media coverage, I think, was, uh, was significant. That, uh, you know, so you know, not much, of the, much of the data uh, is available. I think it, it you know, challenges, I think, many of, many of the stereotypes that you know, people have that, that say you know, nonviolence is unique to certain cultures or, 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 or certain, uh, you know, certain prerequisites there. It underscores what I've been arguing. In fact, um, uh, in my, my first book came out in 1999 that, it, that we are seeing these, uh, this, 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 the use of nonviolent resistance that comes throughout different cultures and different political systems. You know, challenges left wing and right wing, military regimes and one man, man rule, you know, pro West and anti West. And it happens in you know, every every continent and and with different religious backgrounds and different you know I mean it, it's something that it really is a a universal phenomenon I think it, it um, underscores that but I think it, I think perhaps an area where, where the most interesting data which uh, uh, most uh, greatest interest which I talked about in, in my presentation was comparing the nonviolent and violent uh, movements you know side side by side and that I mean I, I think that the um, I think it underscores um, and, 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 and reinforces uh, the, um, some of the, the, the more serious questions about the efficacy of armed struggle and the efficacy of so-called humanitarian intervention uh, relative to in indigenous and largely nonviolent, uh, you know, bottom-up, you know, driven, uh, you know, driven uprisings. But I, I think one of the most in interesting, interesting things that, that come, come out of it also is, again, uh, when you look at the history of, of, of foreign intervention, uh, if you look at in terms of militarization, if you look at in, in terms of um, a whole number of factors, uh, that um, it underscores that, again, you know, people are the drivers of history. 
that that that, that what's striking when I, in my visits to the Middle East, North Africa since the Arab Spring is that people care less about what's going on in Washington, or London, or Moscow, or, or wherever. That uh, you know what the U.S. thinks is less and less relevant, because our power to um, influence things, the power of any outside uh, nation state to to uh, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to shape events is less and less, that, that, that it's more and more in the hands of, of ordinary people. And, and again, given, given the uh, overbearing influence of foreign powers in modern Middle Eastern history, uh, this, this, I think this shift is, is, is a particular uh, significance. I find it fascinating both because I, I'm, I'm mildly, I, I have a strong, long-standing interest in uh, you know, nonviolent uh, uh, social movements, but my primary training has been in, in foreign policy and international relations and strategic studies. And uh, to see these kind of over, overlap this way, I find, find, uh, find really fascinating that the, uh, uh, that, that the study of, of international relations, study of politics, a study uh, is something that is, um, I think, profoundly, is gonna be profoundly uh, shifted you know, by, by this, that, it's, uh, that, the, um, um, that we have to rethink a lot of the traditional uh, concept. So, so I, in other words, I think the big shift is not going to come from people who study, uh, you know, nonviolent movements and social struggles. I think the big, big shift is going to be among the more conventional strategic studies, uh, international relations people, <laughs> uh, in terms of what they have to rethink uh, as a result of uh, of the Arab Spring. Thank you. Briefly, I should mention that I, I do have, I, I have periodic think pieces, policy analysts, analysis that I send out once or twice a month. If you want to be on my email list, you can sign a sheet of paper up here. You can also check out my uh, website, uh, stevenzunas.org. <laughs>